<clears throat> All right, we're at part two of this section. Um, now, what I wanted to talk about is Salvador Dali. <clears throat> now, this artist is a little bit on the weird side. If you've never seen Salvador Dali, um, I know he kind of looks like um, Walt Disney with a funky mustache in some aspects. Um, <clears throat> he is a he's a character. That's the best way to describe him. And I've used this terminology before in the past for him and this to me is really the best the best analysis for him um, if you think about the, the musician uh, Weird Al Yankovic if you don't know Weird Al you might be interested in looking up Weird Al now Weird Al Yankovic um, he does parodies to popular music at, at that time. Now, what is he doing with this? Uh, why would I relate the, that artist to this? Well, what Salvador does is he, he kind of makes mockeries uh, out of a lot of famous paintings, but he's also, uh, he's kind of got this really kind of a sarcastic style, and, um, and he is the king of surrealists. Now, there's other surrealists in this movement, but Salvador Dali, I feel that most of you love more than M.C. Escher and the other uh, surrealists. So, um, so I focus with him. Now, when you look at his name, even in his name at the bottom line, that's his legal name, Salvador de Domingo Felipe San Enzinto, Dali, uh, first of the Medici, uh, first of Palermo, uh, Marcos Palermo. Okay, and so what is he doing there? Well, he's basically uh, doing what the Renaissance did with their names. Like when you think of Donatello, Michelangelo, Leonardo, all of their names are ridiculously long, just like that. We just abbreviated it to be short. Um, now, <clears throat> For his commercial and his video, it, this this kind of sets the tone right off the bat uh, for this chocolate commercial. It's about 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Uh, click it down on the bottom link and give it a whirl. What do you think? It's probably the weirdest thing you've seen in a while. Um, there's lots of videos. He, he was known for his videos. Um, I don't show his videos in class because some of them are a little bit uh, explicit in some acts of uh, news, but they're not. They're not. Um, pornographic they're just really weird um, and there is a little bit of sexual connotation uh, men and uh, speedos and it, it is a little weird but uh, but I'm not really talking more about his commercials and his videos really I want to talk about his artwork um, his is the most recognizable piece persistence of memory um, now when you look at this all right um, it's it's commonly known as the melting clock pieces. Um, now, if, if that's something you've recognized or have seen, if you've never seen it before, well, I'm glad this is the first time you've seen it. But the one thing about Surrealist, it's all about that dreamlike state. So when you look here, okay, what is going on? Well, it's kind of chaotic, in my opinion. And so you look here, and the foreground, the middle ground, the background all kind of line up in the paintings I'm about to show it he pushes and pulls on that and you'll see in a minute but <clears throat> the one thing is like what's down at the bottom now I've heard all different types of answers um, of what the white object is at the bottom um, now I know what it is but most of you guys are in my class and I have trouble seeing it but maybe you see it this way and I just don't um, a lot of people see it as like a goose or a duck or a swan I've heard that at the bottom um, but what is it well it's a portion of Salvador Dali's face uh, being stretched out the little tip that's kind of got this like runny oozy stuff coming out of it um, that is his nose okay at the very tip and it leads into his eyelashes okay and then his eyebrow is the part that curves off the nose and then it runs down the clock and then his mouth is kind of stretched across the plane all right and so it's a face not a not a goose or a duck or a swan um, 
So maybe you saw that at the beginning, but that's what it's about. It's about him dreaming. This is about his dream. And in dreams, as you know, nothing is real, um, and rules can be broken. And so the surrealists play with that. There is no rules to surrealism. Here's a perfect example of that. Now, if you're a big fan of The Matrix, one of the things for the stop-action films, uh, one of the directors said what he was trying to go for was one of Salvador Dali's paintings. And this is the painting he was trying to go for in The Matrix when, the, when time was at standing still and things were still in motion and things were still moving. That's what he, he was trying to replicate in, that, in, in the movies by looking at things he sees in this painting. Now, here's a perfect example is where is the foreground, where is the middle ground, and where is the background? Well, first of all, you've been taught so far the foreground's typically at the bottom of the page. And in truth, it is. So you see the fly at the bottom uh, left side, and there's the foreground. But then you look in the middle ground, and it goes up into the distance at the top where it should be the, uh, the background. But then all of a sudden you look for the background, and it's at the bottom of the page where it normally is not. And this is one of those examples uh, where the idea of of um, rules don't apply for this group. Now here we have soft construct with beans. Now this title is one of those titles that is a little weird. Okay, and this is stereotypical Salvador Dali. Now what is he trying to do with this piece? Well, this piece he's actually starting a war with. Now the piece that he's focusing on, or the artist he's focusing on, who's starting a war with, is again, we've been talking lightly about him through a lot of lectures, is Marshall Duchamp. And I'm going to actually talk a little bit after Salvador Dali about Marshall Duchamp. And <clears throat> now, Marshall Duchamp, one of the things, um, he did a lot of experimental art, um, things called ready mades that were art pieces that were found and already made um, and so the shape that is uh, going across the plane uh, where there's like a corpsed head kind of shape well that's one of his ready-mades in this image and this is supposed to be Marshall Duchamp's corpse body and you can see here one of his ready-mades cuts off his head with his own arm and then his, his ready-made turns into a foot which is pushing down on a torso which then has a foot that is going up his bum so and here he's basically telling the world that he has his own foot up his ass um, which is um, a little it's really different for this time uh, period um, and in 1936 no one had seen anything like this and Marshall Duchamp was really kind of upset about this but the one thing when you Marshall Duchamp is a brilliant man and so is Salvador Dali but he's crazy and that's what's so interesting you can't reason with a crazy person and and that's where this this whole thing falls apart because even Picasso wouldn't even dare to to go after um, uh, Salvador Dali because there's no reason that Salvador Dali would, would just come off and go off and left field. And so, uh, but Marshall Duchamp kind of took on the challenge to fight him in a lot of pieces, but the truth is um, uh, Salvador Dali just was off his rails completely. And even here, there's a little square with a door in the image, um, and it's open, and it's a black kind of square or rectangle at the bottom there. And, and Marshall Duchamp made a an art piece where there's a door in the wall, and you look in the hole, and the little people, and then when you look through, it's this vast world that resembles what you're seeing here in the background. And and basically, in that door, he Marshall Duchamp. Uh, basically gave you this illusion that the world was bigger on the other side of this door and better and then you go around the wall and the wall is only about 10 inches deep and then you realize that there's nothing behind the door and what uh, Salvador Dali is doing here is saying literally there's nothing inside that door um, it's all make-believe and so and Salvador Dali just didn't like him, uh, didn't like his art style, didn't like his whole idea of an artist. So he's attacking him here. Now, 
appreciation uh, or apparition of a face and a bowl of fruit. Now, you can obviously see the face coming right out, and you can see at the top of the forehead the bowl of fruit. But there's other things in Salvador Dali's pieces that, and this is what a lot of people really love about his work, is there's these hidden imagery. Uh, there was a little bit in the last one, um, but this one is, is a little harder to see, and a lot of people really like this one, so I kind of point this one out. If you look in the, in the background, okay, there's this kind of uh, waterish dam kind of shape, but if you notice uh, that it kind of resembles the shape of a dog in the right side, it's, it's kind of like a dog's head. And then it moves down the body uh, towards the back of the legs over on the left side. And so it's kind of got like this kind of hound dog kind of look. And so here he's magically putting a dog into the picture. Um, but what's going on in the background, uh, it's kind of got like these little demons and these little devils that are torturing people. <laughs> um, again, it's it's surreal. So it could be anything it wants to be. and But it has this kind of creepiness to it. But he doesn't talk anything about the dog, but there is a dog in the image, which is kind of interesting. Now, <clears throat> this piece... Uh, I found it really interesting how Dolly went after um, after Duchamp. So <clears throat> we have Da Vinci's Leonardo Da Vinci's uh, Mona Lisa on the left, and I call this a 3D, so you can so you can remember this. Okay, so um, you have here, okay, Leonardo's on the on the left. You have Duchamp's on the right. The only difference between Marshall Duchamp and if you notice, I put a little white border so it can kind of make sense. And you can look down on there and it has L H zero zero Q. Now he bought twenty seven posters from the um, um, uh, the Louvre, and he went in and he took a blue pencil on each one of them and named them LH00A, LH00B, and labeled each one with each letter of the alphabet. And on each one of those, he hand drew a little mustache over the um, uh, Mona Lisa. And at this point, he's now saying that this, I've changed the art, and it's now, this is not Leonardo da Vinci's piece anymore, this is my piece. Now, these sold really well for that period, and Dolly got furious and said, if you're going to change a piece that's so recognizable, like the Mona Lisa, make it more than just a mustache and a, and a, and a goatee. He said, here, if you're going to do a mustache, I'll show you a mustache. And he superimposes his face into the into the Mona Lisa and then he also superimposes his hands and here he's telling uh, Duchamp this is all you care about you just want money and you're not really an artist and now this is where uh, things kind of got a little interesting for Duchamp and Salvador Dali worked until the day he died but <clears throat> here Duchamp um, when he turned the age of 65, he decided that he was going to quit being an artist altogether. Now, this made me kind of interesting when I heard this because I'm an artist, I'll be an artist until the day I die, and I can't think of anything more self-fulfilling for the rest of my life to just make art. And Duchamp made it to a certain level, and basically he goes, eh, I'm done, and didn't make another art piece after six after he turned 65. So, and then he started to pick up chess, and he became this chess player. And here's an image of him playing chess. Now, I put a little blurb about Greenberg talking about Duchamp, and even you can even tell in the video that. Um, Greenberg doesn't even like Marshall Duchamp in some aspects. Uh, he has his disdain, but at the same time, he doesn't even want to even tackle surrealism. So, so he's even staying away from Salvador Dali because he doesn't want to even deal with Salvador Dali. But that's that's where I kind of have a little intriguement on this. Okay, so I you know I. I would love to get into depth with Marshall Duchamp, but Marshall Duchamp is one of those artists that I would actually um, 
I would want you guys to have art history one, two, and three, um, and going into graduate level before we talk about Marshall Duchamp. Um, but what I find is a lot of students get very upset with his work because it's not as um, involved as, as some of the other artists. But he does break a lot of boundaries, and I do respect the man. There's no denying that. Uh, but the but for a beginning course. Um, for just this moment, just understand that the battle between Dolly and Duchamp. Now, here's also a little uh, animated video that's down below. Click on that one, too. And this one talks about Clement Greenberg. And I think this animation that they did was just really wonderful. And it really illustrates Clement Greenberg. And I think after you watch this, you'll get a better picture about him. So, um... And it makes a lot of sense. So it's about five minutes. Uh, it's worth every minute of that. Um, most likely, I might even put some questions for the for your quiz on that about Clement Greenberg. Now, Edward Monk. All right. Uh, this one I usually, when I'm teaching this class live, uh, it always seems to fall in on the fall semester right around the week of Halloween. So this is a good Halloween artist. Um, and, and I think you guys tend to love uh, Edward Monk. Now, we are now leaving the Surrealist, and we are now leaving the, the European... Um, artist okay and we're going into uh, some of the German expressionists so we're now we're going in kind of Germany area now know that this is before World War one okay kind of art art style and it's a little different and you gotta understand the Germans love this expressionist movement uh, it was a very strong movement and they kind of laid a lot of uh, stock into this movement thinking it was going to be a very big movement but as you see in the end of this video, the abstract uh, movement became much much more stronger um, for the Germans' culture, and I think it has to do with the artist. Um, but let's get into his most famous piece, the screen. All right, I'm sure we've all seen this, or ha or have some sense of notion of the screen. Uh, you might have seen it in a cartoon or inside inside a classroom when you're in grade school. It's the most recognizable piece. It's also been the most stolen piece in American history. Um, it's, it's housed at the Boston Museum in Boston. Now, <clears throat> it's been stolen uh, there a couple times, and it's always been returned. And I don't know if it's been returned uh, up of the last stolen time, but it's been stolen at least, I can count, six or seven times. Um, it's usually mob related and then they find it and put it back and then it gets stolen again which you know if this is that stolen of a piece they should find a better place for it uh, so it can't get stolen now when you look at this picture I want you to look in the background okay <clears throat> there is two people you can kind of see a land mass, and some people think that those two little objects that are in the in the for in the background uh, have to do with like a boat or some shape. All right, and then we look at this object that's in the foreground, uh, the screen. Now, is this male or female? Well, a lot of people generally say male because the head's bald and and the shape of the body. Um, feels more masculine but I don't know if I've ever seen a lot of men screaming with their hands across their face um, and typically when I think of a horror film I see that reaction in more horror films or I think of Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone all right now um, but I believe it's a girl and I have another image of this where it kind of makes sense why I think it's a girl but besides that, okay, this also has that feeling of, of a horror film, okay? Have you ever seen the movie where it's got, like, uh, Michael Myers in a scene where he's not a very fast villain, and you can see, like, a scene where uh, a lady's in distress, and she runs out of the house and gets down to the street, and she runs down the street, and as she's running down the street, uh, she's at full sprint. And you look at the, the villain, and he's step by step 
by step. And they do a kind of a wide shot, and you see the villain, and he's like 30 yards away. And then she's running a little extra harder at that moment. And then they cut back, and the, the villain is like four feet away. <laughs> and you're like, how? How did that villain get that distance? Well, in this painting, it's kind of got that same feel, where the villains are in the back, and they're just nonchalantly walking, and she is obviously screaming. Um, now, the title of this also helps. If this was called The Yell or uh, The... Uh, the yawn or anything other than the scream it makes a huge difference so does titles make a difference for art pieces definitely and I tell students this all the time you know you spend this amount of a lot of amount of time working on this piece you should put it as a good title and so uh, that to me um, it makes sense okay because title, it's like it's like having a child and giving it a name. You want to give it a good name, right? So same thing with the piece. You want to give it a good name. So here is a woodcut, okay, a relief print, okay, um, <clears throat> with uh, with the objects, and you can see the characters in the background again. But this time, notice the waters moved to the back, okay, and the ground in the background is uh, a little bit more solid because it's white but I want you to notice one thing uh, and a little bit about him um, the this care this artist believes in the in his paintings he tries to put this kind of characteristic uh, ideas of vampirism he believes that there's such thing as vampires and he would like to meet a vampire and have eternal life in some aspects and there's a reason for it it's not because he's just a, a cult fan, okay? I know there's people out there that love vampires. Um, if you like the Twilight series, I'm not a huge fan of the Twilight series. Uh, I love vampires. I love the idea of vampires. I think it's a great story. But, <clears throat> but to me, what I consider a true vampire movie is like Interview with the Vampire, Brian Stoker's Dracula. Those are good classic vampire movies. Even like the old 1950s vampire uh, movie I love uh, more than than some of the newer Twilight movies. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're fine to watch, but, uh, but to me, and when it comes to vampires, I like that classic vampire feel. Um, and here, um, this, this painting is about that, and those little ships that are in the distance aren't ships at all. They're actual graves, and the vampires came out of them. Okay, and that's why she's screaming. Now, why did I call it a she? If you look, there's a thin little line above the forehead and the on top of the head, and it's a little shawl, a little scarf that she's wearing over her head, which makes her have that bald look. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the Madonna. Okay? Now, this is the Virgin Mary is also, like I said, is commonly known as the Madonna. Now, he's doing this piece to kind of poke a little bit of uh, fun at the Catholic faith. Here is the Virgin Mary, and this is the, um, and this is not the only artist to ever do this, and a lot of artists have done this in the past, is in the um, conception of Christ, okay, during the Immaculate Conception. Um, here, his version, it's very sexualized, all right? Now, and again, he's playing with the idea of vampirism. And you can see these two little bumps on the side of her neck where she's been bitten, and the halo is red instead of, like, a goldish color. So he's basically saying Christ is, the, is, is a vampire, basically. And the Catholic Church got furious with this piece and um they were like we will never have you in the vatican uh with any of the work and da 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 and and his response is i don't care i don't believe in your religion i don't think your religion is real and it doesn't offend me it doesn't offend me that you're that you're upset and he goes this is my art and this is what i want to depict and so uh as that may be, it's kind of it's kind of hard to chastise someone who doesn't believe in your religion, and so, uh, so that's what this is truly about, and um, 
And so it's kind of interesting how he puts this kind of twist on it. Um, and again, he has fans. All right, like I said, there's people that love vampires. Okay, and during this time in the night in the 1890s. Um, He'd have a have a little art show or be in the museum, and people would come to see his work. And because there was these quote unquote vampire fans, and they loved him, and so it was, they were kind of scared about the work, but then at the same time they appreciated it. So now we get to <clears throat> right here uh, the dance, uh, the dance of life. Okay, so here's an image over on the left of his wife. Then he's dancing with his wife in a red dress, and then there's an image of his wife in black. The reason he wants to meet a vampire, she's sick. His wife is sick, and we don't know. We assume she had some form of cancer and died at a very young age, uh, most likely probably breast cancer. Uh, they didn't know how to treat it back then. If you kind of got breast cancer, you are going to die from it. Um, and so here he kind of wants a vampire to bite her and him and change their life for, forever. Now, when you look at also in the background, there is a... A, a, like a lowercase shape I, okay, where the moon and the reflection of the moon's light going onto the water. This is one of his kind of trademark uh, staples, okay, and he's trying to illustrate that, all right. You also might recognize or see the guy dancing with uh, a woman and he's kind of balding looking. And what is he trying to do with this character? Well, he's considering that to be a vampire and it's biting this lady. And uh, and so, again, he's trying to get that uh, that allure from the vampires to, hey, come, come bite us <laughs> so we can live forever. He didn't just limit himself to... Um, to vampires, he also uh, played with the theory of like the lady from the sea, um, and so if you know anything about, and she's named all different types. Uh, Hispanics have a terminology for her. Um, the Irish have her as a screaming banshee. Um, um, so every culture kind of has a version of this, um, and so here uh, this is supposed to be like a. Stir, uh, uh, story for little kids don't stay out past late at night the lady from the sea will come get, get you and drown you and here she is so he didn't just limit himself to one or two uh, villains like vampires he, he kind of pushes himself in that and you can see the up the lowercase i again in this painting now death in the sick room Death in the Sick Room is a piece where it's dealing with her death, okay? Now, <clears throat> the woman looking at you is her, all right? And she has passed away, and now this is her ghost looking at you, all right? So, again, it's got that creepy feel. Um, the people on the right in the top corner in the, for in the background are um, her parents, her her sister's in the foreground, and the priest is on the left. So she was Catholic. Um, but here, uh, he's depicting that her life is continuing as a ghost. Uh, so he kind of plays with that idea uh, that of spirits. And again, uh, fans loved it. So he was pretty much a home run all the way across the board. Ashes. Okay, I really do believe this has to do with a lot of the the books that are out there for Bron Stoker's Dracula. I believe you read the book by this point. I believe it was made at this point. I'm not 100% sure, um, but my my gut's telling me he probably read this, and because this lady here is supposed to be the uh, the redheaded uh, lady that the vampire went after first. Uh, I think her name was Anne in the in the first in the first victim in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, um, here, but this is where it gets kind of interesting. The vampire is ashamed, and he didn't commit the act. And you can see her dress is, is open, and it's a very an, an very uh, disturbing kind of scene out in the middle of the woods. She's She's been taken advantage of, but, but she's looking kind of disposed just shoveled and doesn't know where she's at and there's the vampire in the corner uh, kind of hiding 
uh, in, a, in a shameful manner. And Anne Rice, who wrote Interview with the Vampire, um, I heard her talk about an art, uh, um, in an article that one of the reasons she wrote the book is because of this painting. Um, it made her think of her main character being ashamed to take someone's life. And if you've seen the movie Interview with the Vampire, uh, Brad Pitt's character, uh, that's who she's talking about in this paint in this painting. And so again, this this painting kind of lived on life for other uh, authors and other artists. So. He has a fan following besides the scream. Uh, the scream's a, a great piece, and it's a good one in, in his retro retrospect. But there's other pieces that are just as interesting. So he makes a good Halloween artist. So I always love to debut him during Halloween. <clears throat> Ombro Boncuni. Okay, now I know I just said we're in German artists, and then now I just give you a Roman artist. Um, or an Italian artist. The reason I put him in the German Expressionist is not because his work is German Expressionistic, but he he died at a very young age. He died um, in, in combat, um, and he was a he was a soldier. Uh, he came from a wealthy family, got high, got a highly uh, strong education, very smart man, um, and his work even. Even the titles sound educated. Um, now, one of the things we're going to be talking about with this body of work is um, the way that um, he didn't get accepted in the um, Italian community. Uh, you got to understand, uh, the Italians were really kind of stuck in the Renaissance for way too long. And... <clears throat> and there was a group of artists that were establishing themselves in France, and so he was trying to be like them, and then when he died, the Germans kind of accepted his work style, and he became part of their movement. Uh, even though he's dead, his his work became more famous as as uh, the movement grew for the German Expressionist, and so he became popular at that point. Now his sculpture, unique continuity or unique form and continuity in space. That title right there sounds like an educated artist coming up with a title. Okay, it's not like a one-word title. It's not like man or something like that. And that's what you typically get with an uneducated artist. You get simple titles or really uh, simple titles that could be complex for somebody um, that isn't in. Uh, that's educated but it's a complex title here this is a real simple title it comes right out at you okay so um, now what is this about here he is t copying um, and talking about um, two artists all in one one of his favorite artists is Pablo Picasso so he's talking about Pablo Picasso's um, bull series, okay? And we talked about the bull, the breaking down of the bull. So here he's in the Matatars, and so he's, he's kind of making this bull slash man kind of creature. But then he's also talking about Augustus Rodin. Now, we haven't talked about Augustus Rodin, so this piece will pop up again with Augustus Rodin, and it's relating to his Walking Man series. Uh, Augustus Rodin is the strongest... Um, uh, sculptor for this era, and so he's paying tribute to both of these artists in this piece. Now, this piece is 24 karat gold solid all the way through. All right. Now, a lot of people I like to play a little game. How big do you think it is? Give yourself a, a guess. Now, I always show them this image, and everyone goes, "Whoa!" Well, it's an optical illusion. It's only about I'd say it's about 15 inches tall. It's not. It's a little bit bigger than a foot. Uh, still, I mean, I said this thing's made out of gold, so it's expensive no matter what. And so that also puts in the calibration of how wealthy this this man was. And so here he's taking that and showing that, and he's trying to get himself a name. He figured if I made a really expensive sculpture, people will know who I am. And people did know who he was in Italy, but they didn't accept his artwork because it was not during the traditional uh, Renaissance kind of a feel. The dynamicism of a soccer player, okay? Now, one big thing about uh, sports in Italy and 
other parts of European nation is soccer's huge. It's just as big as any football uh, program here in America. Um, now, this title is Dynamics dynamicism of a football player uh, is a technical team. I turned it to soccer player so you know what we're talking about. I Americanized it. Now, one of the things about um, Broncuni that I love is how he takes the Cubist style from what you look at with Picasso, but remember when I talked about the Cubists, they tended to use earthy kind of colors, and here he's using bright, vibrant colors, and this is supposed to be a man in running form. You can kind of see in the top right foreground the guy's head, and it rolls into his shoulder, and, and then it goes down to his hip, and then his kneecap is coming all the way up into his chest, all right, and he's kind of like in like a, like I would say like a Sonic the Hedgehog kind of a, a shape as he's running if that helps you for you younger people um, it's a little harder to see okay the next piece will make a lot more sense here this is him on a horse he was part of the cavalry all right so he rode a horse for the army and so he's in uniform and you can see the horse the way the legs are moving okay the heads kind of bucking up and down and and he's also talking about the technologies of the um, uh, landscape as it's starting to become more and more industrial. And so he's kind of playing with all that, but see how vibrant his colors are? And that's what the Germans really liked. They liked his color palette. It wasn't like the French people that were doing all these earthy tones. It had this vibrance to it and had this depth and this texture. And the Germans really loved that. So that's why he got accepted. Now... The Surrealists also loved pieces like this, uh, so he kind of got accepted in the Surrealist group as well. Uh, Salvador Dali loved this piece. Now, this is called The Street Enters the House. Now, what is this about? Now, he did a whole series um, at the tail end of his life um, about, about an incident that happened in his hometown. Now, when some people see this, they see like a waterfall going in at the bottom in the foreground. Some people see an old lady. Now, I don't know which one you see, but what's going on is there's a horses down at the bottom on the street that is in a rampage, and they're carrying heavy bricks, and, and it caused a huge incident, and a lot of people were killed in this incident. And so here he's trying to illustrate that but he's also doing in a very optical illusion kind of a feel where the water where it has like a waterfall but then the horses are flying it's it's really kind of unusual so he's kind of playing with a little bit of surrealism in this now here the city rises is his is a piece that he did right before the street enters the house now so this kind of helps illustrate what piece why why he's doing the other piece now you can see here the movement in this is just exquisite how the men are being thrown in the foreground but then notice it, it about on the left side at the uh, in the middle where there's a guy where you can see his face crystal clear and i love how he kind of stops and zooms in onto one little area like it's like slowing down so you can see that one motion as the horse is bucking now if you notice all the little dots of color, okay, here he's playing with the idea like Surat, where it's dot, 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 but so it's dots or dot, 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 but then they're stretched and they're kind of feathery, okay, and this really gives a sense of motion. So he kind of found his own style and he's trying to push it. Here you can kind of see the same painting, but it's in a it's a study, so it's not the exact painting. But here he's trying to figure out what style he wants to do it in, and so this is this kind of almost has like a um, what I would consider a um, uh, Van Gogh kind of line, and it doesn't work. The Surratt line worked much better, and I'm glad he chose that line versus this line. Okay. All right, we're at the man of the hour. This is the man that I've been wanting to talk to you about this whole lecture, uh, Mondrian. Now, Mondrian for me is the top five artist in my in my uh, art history, kind of who I consider is the most important. Um, he would be literally, let's see, I would consider him the 
third most. I'd, I'd make him one, two, and three. He'd be number third. Um, or I'd do Michelangelo as one. I'd do Rodin as two, and I'd do Mondrian as as three. Uh, when I get to those last two, it's kind of hard to choose. I would choose Robert Rauschenberg as my personal favorite as four. Um, but that that's where I kind of. That's where I kind of go from there, and, I, and it's hard to choose that last fifth spot. <laughs> so, but he's definitely in the top and top three for me for sure. Um, now, why would I consider Mondrian to be so highly relevant? Well, a lot of things. Um, the way we look at architecture today, he changed the whole idea the way architecture should look by the way we we perceive art on a wall. Okay, art on the walls before him were tend to be earth tone colors, browns and, and chrome kind of colors, and uh, and greenish colors and grays. Okay, and he said art looks best on a white wall. That's why when you go to most newly built places, the walls are white because it makes the painting stand out. And he found out this with his work that it really pushes the art forward okay so he changed that for the museums he also decided to change the way we look at ceilings not putting beautiful um, um, putting murals on top of the ceilings and keeping it very neutral and the floor staying very neutral now he wrote a book called the little white cube and when he wrote this book um, it's not a very thick book. It's about 80 pages. Um, if you're going to art, if you want to be an artist, and or you want to be an art historian, I would say definitely get this book. It's it will save you so many quotes and so much stuff in art history. Um, I used it all the way through grad school. It's probably the best book to ever find for me. Um, now. I know looking at the man, he looks very serious. He comes from an era where you look serious in pictures. Um, he was actually a very funny guy, and people said he loved to dance. So I want you to think about when you look at his paintings, he would be dancing while he makes them. Now, in his studio, so here's his studio, okay, it's totally opposite of Jackson Pollock, and, and a lot of other artists I've shown you that were very messy. He's a very clean person. I also think he had a little bit of ADD, um, because the little white cube, he talks about how he boards up his windows, and so he can't look outside, because the outside is so beautiful that it, it makes it hard to focus on his art. And so that tells me, I think he had a little ADD, because his, his attention would totally look to the other side when something would go across the window um, <clears throat> now but when you look at his work he's really meticulous and he's a really clean person so this one is his his uh, studio when he was in Paris this is a studio in, in New York City and you can see how he blocked it in in New York all right now Again, like I said, he's really stern looking in the picture. He was a really nice guy and really um, kind of different. And now also, too, notice how the painting's on an angle there. That's going to be important later on. Now, here's one of his first pieces. Now, what I like about Mondrian is how he started as an artist. All right. He was not accepted into art school right off the bat. He went to an art school in Denmark, where he's from, and he showed up and he and said, I'd like to go to art school. And they're like, well, let's see your art. And he didn't have any art. So one of the teachers took a little pity on him and said, hey, go study with, with this person. So he immediately went and studied, went, went back to the art school after he worked with the artist for a little while and said I'm ready and they looked at his work and they accepted him so basically I think he kinda went to community college a little bit and then got into the university okay uh, he excelled in the university and he graduated early alright and they told him if you want to be successful move to Paris so he moves to Paris and he was engaged to be married and he called off his engagement because his his wife or future wife did not want to move to Paris and so he moves to Paris single and he stayed single he never got engaged again um, and so this is one of his earliest pieces now you've heard me use the word Clement Greenberg okay a few times well Clement Greenberg is going to be really important in this body of work um, the way he 
dictated his style throughout it. Now, early on, these were not accepted really well in the in the Louvre and other museums and galleries. They said it looked like bad uh, uh, Vincent Van Gogh paintings. I disagree. I love it. I think it's a beautiful picture. I think it has a lot of character. Um, if I woke up every morning seeing that, no matter how rainy it is outside, to me this would be a beautiful piece to wake up to every morning. But that's just me. Um, some people, you might agree with them saying it's too bright, too vibrant. So he kind of tones it down and goes into a more traditional. Now, see, this is one of the things about him. He's trying to find his style, and he's trying to copy and emulate other artists. Okay, so Vincent Van Gogh is probably the inspiration of that last piece. Looking at this one, can you guess who it would be? Hopefully you said Monet. Now, if you said Monet, you're correct. So here you get the water, but notice Monet's colors are more realistic. These are almost exaggerated. And so... So here he, he still falls short. He, he's making a bad Monet. And, and so he's listening to critics at this point, trying to figure out his style. But then one thing clicks, okay? What does he like mostly? Well, he does this tree, and this tree changes the whole gamut of his work. And it's amazing. Some artists, it takes one art piece to just click. And once it clicks, it from then on, it starts to just build and build and build, and that's what's happening with this, okay? He loves the idea of a, of a tree, and so when I talk about Picasso breaking down the bull, well, here, Mondrian breaks down trees into the simplest shape, but what he found out in this painting, what he was more excited about was doing the, neg the negative blue colors inside the tree, then doing the tree itself, and when he painted this, he didn't just put down a wash of blue and then put the tree on. No, he put the tree down, and then he did the background, and he's trying, and that's why the blues are all kind of funky as you look into the gaps of the tree, and to him, that was more important than the actual tree. And this started a whole new language in, in 1909 for him. And so here's another version of the tree. It's a watercolor. Now we have a large collection of these trees at the Dallas Museum of Art. We have a huge uh, Mondrian section. So if you've never been there, go check them out. They're really wonderful tree in gray, okay, so in 2009 to 2012, so we have this, and you can see how he's taking out the color of the tree. Like I said, the tree is not important. To him, it's the gray that's important, okay, and see, and how the the background is just as heavy as the, as the tree itself, and it's just as important, so for him, or even more important, Okay, and it's leaving that sensible idea of the shape and going more into the abstraction. So he's going to keep going more abstract. So same time period, but I love this one. Apple tree and flower. Now, the tree trunk is, is starting to disappear, and you can see the, the, the foliage at the top, and he has these kind of leaf-like shape going through the middle of the painting that gives you the illusion that it's a tree by the pattern that he's given here. I find this painting to be just exquisite. Now, Clement Greenberg, when he saw this piece, this was one of the first things he wrote about in his earliest career and kind of helped his career as well. And so he kind of followed and tagged on to, to Mondrian all the way through his career and, and Mondrian's career. Um, now, Picasso was upset at this point, all right, because now this new kid's in the block and he's and he's doing work. Now, Picasso is so much more uh, popular than Mondrian here. Mondrian's just uh, pr just shocked that even Picasso finds him as a threat, and so that's what's so amazing about this. He's so very humble. Now, in the tree in, in bloom, you can see here, I love how the foliage has this really kind of geometric shapes and how it pushes and pulls at the top of the page. But then at the bottom, you can see multiple little trunks. So he's kind of going back to that, that trunk-like shape. So he, he kind of wavers in and out, but I still think apple tree in bloom or blossom is still one of my favorites. 
now here, okay, now it's just composition trees. It doesn't even tell you what kind of weather it is, if it's in bloom or not. It's now getting down to the part where it's just geometric shapes into forms of trees. Um, these are not my favorite, but a lot of people tend to like these. Uh, I like them when they're a little, have a little hint of color into them. Now, here is two versions of his work. Now, the first version you see there is his earlier on, where he's kind of has a Manet kind of a style, all right? And he loved this painting. He wouldn't sell it, and he kept it in his studio as a reminder. And this is always good for beginning artists, to always keep something from the past to remind you of where you were as you grow as an artist. And here he tries to replicate it in the second image. When he replicates this painting in the second image, he gets a really um, uh, kind of a more cubist style. And then now this became his more fa uh, favorite painting. I actually like the more uh, realistic one on the left versus the one on the right, but that's my opinion. You might like the right side a little bit more. It depends on what you like. But see, here's a good example of how he takes one style and then blends it into another style to create something different. Now here, his paintings now leave the square format and now become into this oval composition. And we're going to be talking about the oval composition. Now this is a it says church at Dannenberg. I've never been to Dannenberg. Um, I don't know how many churches they have. If they have one Catholic church, maybe you can recognize it. But if, when you look at the shape on this, you can definitely tell how the shape of it feels when you look at the uh, kind of arches in the image, and you can see the crucifix and you kind of see the rose window stained glass kind of feel in it so it definitely has like a church feel but at first glance you might not know what it is until you look at the title um, that's that is very common in his work now here's another oval composition and right here now this is on a square plane he just draws in the circle now what is going on in this well when you watch the documentary that I have at for him at the bottom when you click on that link um, you'll see this image and you'll see from his studio window what they're talking about in this piece and what they're talking about in this piece is it's what's outside of his window and so it is a building kind of structure of a skyline in between other buildings and it's kind of neat how you can see what he's looking at and how this piece was created because um, at first glance when I took it as a, as a student um, I didn't know what I was quote unquote looking at until I saw this documentary on him and then I it made more sense and I almost wish my teacher had shown us that documentary so I put the documentary down at the bottom so uh, click on it it's about five minutes uh, the whole documentary is about 45 minutes um, if you want to look it up online it's it's free uh, but I just chose a, a small insert, which would give you a good insight on him. Now, uh, composition number 10, the pier and ocean. Okay, this is where Clement Greenberg says um, Mondrian uh, dropped the hammer on Picasso. Okay, he said he couldn't break any image down to any further uh, than, a rec than this recognizable object. Um, he started to make friends with a lot of the abstract artists uh, in the 1910s and 1920s and so uh, Kandinsky was one of his inspirations and so so here he's taking on the, what we call some some people call it the plus and minus painting now if you kind of blur your eyes I want you to kind of look at it from top to bottom and you might have a sense of ocean the way the waves are coming in but notice there's like a kind of a silhouette kind of structure that's going in the middle okay and it's coming forward here uh, and it's supposed to give you a pier. A pier is a landmass that sticks out into the ocean and you can kind of see it. it's kind of like one of those magic eyes where it kind of lightly appears um, and so um, so that's where that so this piece Clement Greenberg just gave him glowing reviews but that's not where it stopped it went here next I want you to write down this title, Composition, Red, Blue, and Yellow. All right. This was his groundbreaking piece. When, Cle when Clement Greenberg went into a gallery and he would look at his work, okay, or look at other works by him, um, he would 
get fascinated and he would look at the piece and he would spend some time on each piece. Uh, it was kind of a bad sign if he walked into a space and turned around and walked right out. Um, and so he generally stayed a lot of time in his ex ex exhibitions and he would give uh, great feedback in his writings and Clement Greenberg really uh, loved this piece. Now, what is about this piece? At first glance, you guys might look at it and kind of go, uh, all right, I see a red square, a blue square, a rectangle, and a yellow square. I don't get very much out of it. It's not the colors, and it's not the black lines. It's the white squares that matter. Okay, if you notice the yellow square at the top, the, the white squares that are near it, the white is different. He adds a very small amount of yellow to the white where it still stays white but it's a hue change just a tiny bit of, of white that has a little bit of yellow and the white is a little brighter. If you look down at the bottom okay where the blue is you can actually see that the white is a little bit cooler next to the blue okay and then you look at the red and the white is still just a tiny bit uh, got kind of a, a warmth to it and, and some people say it's just because the colors are next to it, it makes an optical illusion that your eyes automatically see it. But I, I've seen in this documentary watching him paint, he puts four to five different whites in one square until he finds the perfect white. Okay. And, and that, to him, is what makes it work, okay, having that blend of four to five different whites in the image. And that's what Clement Greenberg liked. That's what, that's what he was fascinated about, that he, he broke down the color white, okay? And so, so this piece has multiple layers. Now, where is he getting his imagery from? Well, he looks for design patterns wherever he goes. It might be the way a street looks on, on a map. It might be the way, uh, topological, the way the ground is laid out. Um, it might be just the way a, a, a fence goes across the plane and maybe a little bit of a blue line from a sign goes in between that medium. And so he's constantly trying to figure out the sense of design that's interesting as he builds this piece. And so this was the first start of a big series. And he worked on this series for 10 years. And you can see here's composition number two. Same kind of color palette, but notice that the white isn't as important as the first one. And I think it kind of missed the mark on the second one. I think he was still investigating. But now when you go to the Dallas Museum of Art, they have about six to seven of these, and they're all variants, and they're different. And notice the whites. That's the important thing. <clears throat> all right, he moves to New York City, and this changes everything, okay? The whole layout of his whole system. Why did he move to New York City? Did he want to go? No. Okay, he wanted. He, he was afraid as Hitler was advancing into uh, Paris, where he was living at the time. Uh, he could have ran to Denmark, but he was afraid to even go there. Um, Hitler loved artists. He loved coming towards artists. He loved getting artists. And um, uh, Monet is a uh, no, yeah Monet. Uh, Marmy Mondrian, sorry, is a um, is a Jew. And so he was worried that um, they'd find out about his Jewish heritage and they would hurt him. So he left everything in New York. He was a millionaire in New York, I mean in, uh, in, in Paris. He left all his money. When you left the country during these times, um, your money was frozen and you could not get it. There was no getting your money back. Um, now, so he moves to New York City, and he gets there in 1941, okay, right when uh, the Americans start going into war. Um, when he gets to America, um, he has a friend who's an architect, and he sets him up with an apartment, pays for everything. He just wanted him to be safe, all right? And one of the things when they were working, when he was working on a piece, he was trying to come up with this new idea, and he loved New York City, the way the grids, the, the way the setup of the streets, and everything in the 40s. So here, he's trying to find a new style, and so instead of using black lines, he uses colorful lines, and the white uh, stays the same in, in these original images, and these are all his tape drawings. They're all done by tape, and 
Now his friend's an architect, I said, and architects use this tape to, to illustrate the yellow for gas, the red is for electric, and the blue is for water lines. So when they're doing uh, plumbing and all that on a newly built house, they know exactly where to put it in the blueprints. And so that's what he was fascinated with this tape but even with the tape if you notice in the second one he didn't like all the blues the way that they're given to him so he even paints the blue that's how OCD he is about this now he does a body of work and this is the first piece he enters okay now Clement Greenberg is is, is stationed in New York City okay and so he was quite excited to see him come into this um, into this uh, uh, New York style of uh, art world. Now, it's a young art world at this point in 1943, and so this is where it gets kind of interesting. Um, he does this whole series. Now, this is called Broadway Boogie Woogie. He loved that jazz boogie woogie sound. Okay, and so he's even titling it in his art piece, and he's making it look like a city, like in New York. And so here you can see the buildings, you can see the the yellow of the street, and the little squares are people or cars in the position. So now, when Clement Greenberg goes in and sees this, he walks in and turns around and walks right out and he writes an article that is just shameful um, and I can't believe he he did this to this man he wrote something saying he should have stayed in in uh, in Paris and risked being caught by the Nazis than doing career suicide and moving to New York okay he did not Clement Greenberg did not like these okay and of course this made Picasso happy to see him get knocked down a couple pegs um, but at this point it, it was crucial that he sold art because he had no money and he felt guilty uh, living off of his friend and this is where uh, Clement Greenberg really uh, took his power and really kind of abused it in some aspects because if he would have wrote a good review on this he probably would have sold his work and probably made a little bit of money and this is kind of the dismay, dismay of of him because uh, that the next year it was really tough and you can see in that painting he was doing in that picture of a painting that was kind of a side angle he was doing victory boogie woogie and basically with this piece he's trying to dedicate his his life and say to Clement Greenberg I will be victorious with this painting now he died in the process of making it now he didn't die of any natural causes he actually died a very gruesome way um, he was too ashamed to tell his friend who was paying his rent um, that uh, he couldn't afford to pay his heating bill and he's not used to um, New York's cold weather and he caught pneumonia in bed and he actually died in his bed from pneumonia and and his room was at at freezing temperature and he actually froze in his room which is just a horrible way to go now they said when he was in bed and found dead he had the painting right next to his bed and he was painting um, while he was under covers and he passed away um, laying next to next to the painting which is very romantic in some aspects but now when Clement Greenberg heard about this he felt immediately guilty about his review on on his work and he wrote a, a retraction basically apologizing uh, for for abusing his power and then he wrote a review on this piece and he said that this painting is the key uh, to Mondrian all right and it is a good article and I actually kinda like it uh, I don't agree with it a hundred percent because uh, uh, the way he kind of felt wishy-washy in the article. But what he's, he's basically saying is that every painting we've ever seen of Mondrian, it's finished and highly polished. This pa painting, it has pieces where the colors have multiple colors laid and stacked on top of themselves. And it allows the viewer to pretend that you're Mondrian and you get to choose how, how this piece would have been laid out. Now, 
Clement Greenberg also says in a statement that um, if this piece was completed, this would probably have been his greatest piece and probably one of the greatest pieces of history of mankind for art. Um, that's a big statement to make. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think it is a valid statement. It's a great painting because uh, he was totally trying to change his views. Now, this is the one thing about Mondrian that I, that I love about it, is he wanted to be accepted. He wanted people to accept him. He wanted to be accepted in the college. He wanted to be accepted in the art world. When he got that acceptance, he still pushed himself, and he wanted to be accepted uh, in the art world. And so to put him in my top three, he was the underdog out of most artists, overcame more than any artist, and he changed the way the world looks, okay? So in today's time, with what he did, he is a, a, he's made the world better. Now, when he passed away, if you go to New York ever, and you want to see um, uh, Mondrian's um, hotel, or not hotel, but uh, apartment, you can, the Metropolitan Museum bought the building, and it's now a museum, and you can go up to the sixth floor where he lived, and you can go look at the room. Now, when you notice, when you walk in the room, there's going to be tons and tons of writings from all different artists that were inspired by him, and I guarantee he would have loved seeing these. Now, <clears throat> um, from here, um, what I find was quite interesting, there's musicians, uh, there, the Beatles even came and wrote something on the wall, um, and, uh, but pa uh, Pablo Picasso showed up when he came to America, and he said, you are my greatest uh, challenge, and you are also um, the greatest champion I ever fought. Um, and so, which I thought that was kind of interesting, he gave him a nod after he passed away. Um, I think... Definitely, uh, Mondrian made Picasso better in some aspects. Like I said, he's a chameleon. He, he stole from certain ideas. Um, I think he stole the idea of always pushing yourself, um, and so, which I thought was really quite interesting. Um, now, and uh, so you got to understand, Picasso was very young at that point, too. Um, now, when they were fighting, they were very young at that point. Um, now, the other thing, um, if when you go to the museum, um, when you walk down the or get to the stairs, there are always some people putting kind of some kind of shrine flowers at the doorsteps. Um, but the walls, as you walk into the space, they're just filled full of people's signature. Now, so if you wanted to, if his work moved you in some way and you showed up, you could write on the wall how he moved you, and it's full of thousands and thousands of messages. And, you know, like I showed you the, the Van Gogh uh, exhibit, I would love to take him to that apartment where he lived and show him how many people love him. And I guarantee you that would bring tears to anybody's eyes. Now here's the video. Click on it. It's a great video um, and it will give you a good understanding about this artist. Now here, okay, is the next part. All right, and you can see uh, the difference between the galleries, see how dark those walls are. This is before Mondrian with the Marshall Duchamp piece. Uh, and then you can look at the piece in the gallery the way it looks now. And it's the, the space is just night and day different. Okay, Franz Mark will be the next artist I will get into. Now, I'm going to try to get this all done in 20 minutes, so I'm going to kind of rush through Franz Mark. Franz Mark is a German uh, that was really uh, loved. Again, he died in the war at the same time as uh, Braun Cooney. Um, now, when you look at his work, he deals with animals, and people love his, his style with animals. So if you love animals, you're going to love it. Here's Yellow Cow. Okay, so Yellow Cow is a, um, you can see it's almost like it's a coloring book filled in with the colors around it and with the black lines. Large Blue Horses, one of his final pieces he made before he passed away. Um, this is during a group that called the Blue Riders that he was part of, and you will uh, see that in just a minute, um, where he's talking about uh, his social kind of, 
uh, networking uh, as a young man. But uh, but again, it's just robust courses, so to speak. Hidden Tiger is is next one, and now it's more in the geometric shape. I love this one called Two Pigs. Uh, when I was uh, in school, uh, I saw this in my class for the first time, fell in love with it, and I looked up online and found a place that had a poster of it. And, and when I was in college, I bought the poster, framed it, and put it above my, my stove. I, I thought it would make my bacon taste better. But I, I love the sense of design, the, the flow, and it's totally different than any German expressionist at this time. It's very, it's very clean and very uh, colorful. Uh, the fox den again more geometric um, playing with that idea of abstraction and then here uh, we have um, his first the the first art car ever made now this is his car now if you google search him you'll find this car and and this was his car and so now did he expect people to fall in love with him for his car no uh, but this is where the whole start began okay BMW saw this and thought that they should do their series of cars but this is where it starts out from and too bad they don't put this in their display uh, Picasso actually saw this and bought it and that's where the whole story came from okay Kandinsky all right we're gonna focus on Kandinsky now to help you to remember how to spell his name his name's a little can a little tr tough to remember um, I always do this, and this kind of word uh, always helps me. It's K and N Sky. Kandinsky. Okay, K and N Sky. All right. And now Kandinsky is the first German uh, expressionist, but he, or uh, ab uh, abstractist. So he does abstraction. He's the king of abstraction. All right. Before him, there was no abstract movement so he is the be the beginner for all of this movement okay so his first piece that I wanted to talk about is the Blue Riders now he worked with Franz Mark and now Franz Mark was a student now uh, Franz Mark would would take articles and he would um, write letters to artists to basically get it would be a simple question and people would fill it out then he would publicly uh, pu publish his uh, his version of the blue riders now uh, the blue riders here you got you got uh, it's April and March so they did bi-monthly uh, you can be a um, uh, you could have been a person that bought it once a month um, and then what they would do is they would public uh, publish all their their findings. So basically, he was the first Twitter or first social media artist, and they and they worked together as a team uh, making this. And so that's why the Blue Horses and Franz Mark are so important, is because of this piece called the Blue Riders. Now, when you look at Kandinsky's earliest works, it's figurative and landscape. Um, it, they look like everything you've seen before, okay? Well, playing with the idea of Picasso and all them, but it's still kind of abstract, but it's still not pushed and, and pulled as much as as it's going to be in the future, in the future pieces coming up. Um, here's where the piece where Picasso got after him for using the pink color. He said pink colors are weak, and so you can see here it has a really uh, pinkish color, um, and it's it's basically kind of talking about how uh, in Germany that the landscape uh, was is really beautiful, but now it's becoming more and more industrial. And then here, okay, is one of his pieces that he did. Now, you got to understand, okay, he is a German artist during World War II and before World War II. And he is um, uh, basically explaining that not everybody that lived in Germany is a Nazi. And so here, he's trying to show the world that there's more to Germany than Nazis at this time. And not everyone believes in the Nazi party. He definitely did not believe in the Nazi party. Um, 
And so here, actually, he almost got in trouble for the piece at the in the for, in the foreground at the bottom. You can see on the right side a star of David kind of a shape, and he made it abstract so uh, so he wouldn't get in trouble. Okay, and if you look at the square in the center, that's the school he teaches at called the Bauhaus, and we'll be talking about this at the end. All right, but let's get into his abstraction pieces. Now, what is going on in this piece? Well, he's taking a terminology that we all know and love. Okay, I'm sure you went through school and you took a science or math class. Okay, you might not love science or math, but it's hard to make, if I told you, make me a painting with science and math included. Now, this is what he's doing. So, he, if you look at the little circle over on the left that's blue, um, it He's taken a little bit of astronomy that's dealing with science, okay? And if you notice, this is the same kind of symbol that you see on the NASA logo, okay? And NASA used, copied this from this painting for their logo, all right? But then you look over at the other circle on the right, and it looks like a Petri dish, all right? And so with all the little spores, and so he's trying to make an abstract petri dish and then he mixes in between with x and y axis and grids and he's talking about geometry and algebra okay he was highly educated man and he loved playing with this idea of science and math but then he also gives it in this abstraction and no one has seen anything like this before now this one is um, uh, composition number 10 um, now this is having to do with one song. Okay, he would listen to one song over and over, and it was Beethoven's uh, Fifth Symphony. And and if you've ever heard it, it's a very long song. So when you when you look at this, he's trying to listen to the sound and picture what color those notes are. What's if a darker sound, like a tone, like a deep bass sound, would that be a darker, cool color? Or would it be a light, bright color, okay? Um, um, so so he kind of went for deep is the darker sounds, okay? And for like a, like a tinging, kind of banging kind of sound, like a cymbal, okay, would be more of a yellow tone. Now, also, if you see the gigantic triangle that's in the middle of the page, okay, with an arm over on the right, okay, what this is, if you're anybody that plays a musical instrument, he's making this general shape of a metronome, okay, and a metronome is what keeps your tempo, okay, as you play the song. So he's trying to illustrate the, so the sound of this music with song. Now, you might have seen something very similar if you've ever seen the movie Fantasia, uh, this is where the artist from Fantasia got this idea from. Now, here, okay, this is a piece that's made directly uh, to um, uh, Mondrian, okay, and he's right here. He's basically uh, talking to him, and, and he knew how much he loved boogie woogie music. And so what I'm what he what he's trying to do is he's he's making a boogie woogie piece listening to one song. I don't know which song it was, but he did title this composition uh, "Red, Blue, and Yellow," just like you saw in the first pieces of Mondrian. So he is definitely uh, letting people know that this piece is for Mondrian. Now I'm going to show you this in your and for your. Um, uh, midterm, I want you to uh, write what song do you think it is. I don't know what the song is. Now, I want you to choose a song that fits your vocabulary. What do you see? Okay, and I've heard some beautiful things over the years, um, so I really want you to kind of elaborate in, on that. All right, and then we'll. So now we're going to get into the Bauhaus. All right, so here, the Bauhaus, um, now what the school was basically for, um, it was a school structurally for artists, engineers, uh, anybody that dealt with any sense of the art form, architects, um, and this was the first school of its kind. Now, Kadinsky taught here, and so did many artists that are uh, very important. Uh, now, 
the one thing, if you're from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, I wanted you to kind of get this as a mental picture. Uh, one of the main architects that, that taught at the school, uh, his name is Buckmaster Fullard. And if you look at certain parts of the city of downtown Dallas, like the Reunion Tower Ball was a is a very iconic building. Uh, that was done by Buckmaster Fullard, who taught at the school as well. Now, also, too, if you ever are driving uh, in the area off of 75 and Mockingbird, there's a Mockingbird station uh, for our dart rail. And if you look at the building there, it's resembled to look like the Bauhaus. So the architects who designed that wanted it to have this Bauhaus kind of a feel. Now, when we look at this building in today's standards, there is nothing out of the ordinary. It looks pretty much like a warehouse kind of a feeling building. But back then, in 1922, to have one side of a building being made out of solid glass, this was groundbreaking. Uh, everything you see in this building for its time, uh, is it, it's totally changed the whole look of architecture. And to be part of this, which I think is kind of interesting, um, would have been a great adventure uh, for a lot of these artists and uh, and the students. Um, but as you look at 1933, like I said, this is in Germany. Now, one of the main things Hitler did not want is people to have their own way of of uh, freedom of th their own thought. They wanted he wanted everything to be kitsch, which was easy to understand, easy to read, and he didn't want uh, people to have their uh, artistic freedom. Um, some people talk about Hitler going to art school. Uh, I don't think he would have been a very good artist, possibly. <laughs> um, uh, he's very, very uh, depressing <laughs> and some and really overly uh, aggressive. So I don't think he would have made a fine artist. So uh, maybe he's a little jealous of the school. Could have been that. But I think it really boiled down as he was afraid that uh, the students would have too much liberty and they would uh, start an uprise with their art movements. So now looking here, when you look at this building, um, um, when you see a building that has what we call a skywalk in it, now skywalks are <clears throat> are a portion that literally it's like a bridge that goes from one building to another. In Cedar Valley Community College, we have two of them on the campus, and no one even thinks about it as being anything uh, of a marvel um, in today's architecture. But back then, this was groundbreaking. Now, the architect that designed this is the same architect that also uh, designed the Golden Gate Bridge. And so, so this kind of tells you the caliber of artists that are in this in this uh, facility. It's it's a lot of uh, big named artists. And now the school is reopened. It reopened about ten years ago, and you can go to school there. There's tons of grants uh, and tons of opportunities for Americans to go take a class during the summertime. Uh, I've even thought about doing it for my own personal because I've just always thought of it as a very romantic place to be and would love that on my resume to go work there. Um, now here, all right, is what it looks like, looked like um, in the in the 90s and 2000s. So as you can see they've cleaned it up uh, in the last picture but here uh, it was kind of, it's, it's not in a great area of Germany. Uh, it's actually a very industrial uh, area. Um, and it's it really is not a safe area when it when it was when it was run down. Since they've cleaned it up, they've done a really great job of revamping it and renovating it. Now here, okay, um, besides being a beautiful building, this is Kandinsky's house. This is where he lived. Uh, now, 
a lot of people see this, oh, this is a newly built house, a newly built architecture. This is really popular in the in the Texas area. These kind of styles of homes are becoming more and more popular. And I love hearing people say, I just don't like these new modern homes. Well, the funny thing is they've been out since the 1920s. It's just people don't consider this to be classic architecture or what we consider uh, southern architecture. Um and so it does have a modern feel, um, but it's but this stems from the 1920s. Uh, so I always find it funny when people say it's got this modern look to it. If you get a chance to go to Germany, I highly recommend you look at his home. He has some beautiful art pieces inside. His studio is is breathtaking. The way that large square window looks out into it. Now this is the last artist, Egon Shields is who I'm going to be covering here. Now Egon Shields um, is a really kind of a troubled artist. I would say he's in the same kind of a troubled artist as uh, Van Gogh was, but the difference is is he actually sold his work. Um, as you know, he didn't. He looked there as date. He didn't live very long. Uh, lived to be the age of uh, 28. Um, he died from uh, syphilis, which is a at that time it's a uh, was a very uh, uh, aggressive disease. In today's time, it, it's actually can be cured. Um, it's a sexually transmitted disease. Now, the one thing about his work. I'm going to quickly go through it, but I want you to look at some of the things. It's his line work. It's the way he draws a human. He really puts a soul into his drawing ability. Now, when you look at his his hands, he has a style to the hands. Even in this picture, he's kind of making this kind of, if you're... If you're thinking he's doing like the West Side uh, gangster sign, that's not what he's doing. Uh, he's trying to cover his fingertips. That's the telltale sign that you have syphilis is you bleed out your fingertips and either your fingertips are surgically removed um, or they are... Um, or they kind of scab over and uh, so he's hiding those in his imagery now the one of the things about him contracting syphilis it's who he got it from is what makes this artist more troubled than anything uh, he was contracted uh, syphilis from his father and he also contracted uh, gave syphilis to his sister as well um, so both of him and his sister were abused and and she is one of the main subject matters in the pieces she typically has a reddish colored hair and I'll explain her image as as we go through um, but he considers himself to be a monster and I think when you're ever troubled this way uh, you can see uh, the troubling imagery in his work and, and it screams out that he was abused um, now besides that um, there's also another woman in here she's a brunette he was engaged to a woman that knew about him having syphilis and I think she just truly loved him but I don't think they could have had a, a physical relationship uh, or she might have already contracted syphilis and they just kind of kept it between themselves which that's common today with AIDS people today so here's a show that he was in in 2004 when I first got out of grad school, I st or undergrad, and I studied him uh, in undergrad, and I loved his line work. So to see his show in person, it really meant a world to me, and I thought it was kind of timely. I graduated, and boom, there's his show. Um, so in person, these pieces scream off the paper. Now... He was a painter, and he has that German expressionist kind of feel, that dark kind of color, just like if you were to think about Edward Munch. Um, uh, same kind of feel, same kind of style. Um, they both definitely kind of had this the same kind of uh, uh, feeling in between their uh, brushwork and their... So they're, so they're kind of in the similar path. Now, the next piece right here, this piece is one of my favorite art pieces out there. Um... I love the way he drew his sister here. Uh, the way her eyes are very intense, the way she's looking at you. Um, and it's done with such delicate lines, super fast. But also what I love besides the line work, it's the opening between the hands and the body. And he leaves that area 
uh, negative and, and leaves it out with, without any lines, but does he need it? And that's the question. He knows right where to stop at a drawing, and that right there is what makes him an amazing artist. He's also not afraid to show flaws, and that's another thing. He's a very confident artist. But when it comes to painting, not very strong. I uh, actually think he's very weak. I think he's kind of like um, Degas in the same aspect, where Degas was a really strong pencil and pastel drawer, uh, but then when it came to oil paints, was quite quite weak on that skill. So not everybody's a painter, not everybody's a drawer, but it doesn't hurt to do a little bit of both. Now, when I look here, see, same woman. But look at the intensity. Look at how strong this drawing is. Now, this is his sister again. Um, why is he drawing his sister? Well, the reason is um, she contracted uh, syphilis at a, even a younger age. And so it was right before her body started changing. And she, was a, she loved to dance ballet. And so here she's in one of her ballet outfits. She still performed. But you can see the, the scars on her arms and, the, and the, the spots that she's... So he's not hiding that she has the disease. But if you notice, I love how he stopped where the shoe kind of ends, and you can see at the very bottom, the, like the tongue of the shoe, and it's one simple line. Now, could he have completed that foot? Sure, but the way it's just built up, it is just it's it's just the right amount of lines, and the body, and all the clothing, and the and the textures with the with the uh, uh, oil pastels, it's just exquisite. And so when I look at this, there's parts of it that are so right and everything, but I feel sad for the imagery itself. Now here is another one of his imagery. Now again, uh, here she's wearing a wig, and so he's kind of copying Toulouse Lautrec, and he's doing this kind of can-can style dancing. Now, um, He's infatuated with the can-can. Um, now, I put him in the classic with the with the German expressionists, um, but he was also super popular with the uh, with the uh, impressionists as well, and the post-impressionists. Uh, so he he was a big fan of Toulouse Lautrec, and the French loved him. Um, and his work. But notice on this drawing, look at the shoe on the far left. What I love about this is see how he, he, he fixes the shoe at one point, but then realizes the shoe needs to be a little bit longer. And instead of filling that in, that mistake, he leaves it alone. And I love that he leaves that little break in between. Now notice in this one, same kind of thing. Can uh, Can style dancer. Um, I'm kind of a provocative picture, and yes, it is his sister, but you got to understand, these, these two people were quite abused by their father. Now, when you look at the shoulder, okay, um, it's one line to do that shoulder. You look at the neck, it's one line. To do that jaw, it's one line. But then he spends all that detail into the fabric, and he gets all this kind of emotion in that with the body, but he when he chooses to... to select one section and just get that one simple line he's perfect at this now here's one of his more monstrous self-portraits he did a few of these and as, especially as he got sicker uh, you can see the disease taking its toll on his body and he considers himself to be a monster but the sad thing is he's not a monster he was abused and so I feel bad for the guy now, here's the brunette. Now, this is his, uh, he did the same kind of poses with his um, um, uh, fiance. And now, this to me is a little bit more acceptable because it's not his sister. Um, but they're still very provocative nonetheless. And here's the last one, of, and you can see where it kind of does that, that borderline of provocative. Now, I. If you go see one of his shows, I'm just warning you, do not take children to see his work. These are the PG-13 pieces I just showed you. Uh, there are R-rated and, I would say, borderline X-rated uh, imagery in his work. So, uh, it's not a suitable show for kids, but it's a suitable show for adults. Um, Alright, on that note, take the next quiz. I'll see you in the next lesson.